You're listening to Maya. My ambition, your ambition. You will hear me say, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. And that's not my coined phrase, but I love it because it's true. The minute something challenges you, you have to ask yourself, what do you do with it? Be sure to check out this and other episodes at mayaakai.com. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Maya, My Ambition, Your Ambition. If you are a first-time listener to the podcast, well, welcome aboard. And if you are a previous listener, well, welcome back. And if you have to do a little catching up, well, that's okay, because remember, all podcasts are available at mayakai.com. That's one through four. And of course, I'm also available in the iTunes, Google Play, and iHeartRadio podcast platforms. Just search Maya, My Ambition, Your Ambition, and voila, you can get caught up. So with that being said, the podcast, of course, I always say I look to embrace and address salient topics from a fresh and forward-thinking perspective. At least that's how I see myself. I tend to feel like I'm spot on most of the time. This episode will dive into that a little bit and You'll see why I feel that way. And you may feel this way about some things about yourself as well. But of course, the focus of the podcast is to pull back that veil of self-doubt and self-sabotage that plagues so many of us in our lives to help identify our ambitions. But more importantly, to harness the motivation to help us to yield the satisfaction and success that we seek in our daily lives. So notice I say we because this is the journey we take together. This isn't about this being therapy or anything like that, even though I'm a mental health counselor. I have been for the past 15 years working in the mental health field. This is more of an intimate conversation about personal growth for myself, and I want to share others to have that same experience that I have, because when you do grow personally, emotionally, mentally, physically, and financially, it's amazing how it impacts all the other aspects of your life. So with that being said, as I always say, get comfy. Grab your beverage of choice, whether it's a cup of coffee or tea, a glass of water or wine or beer. Find that space where it can be quiet for you, where you can be comfortable. So maybe it's your favorite spot on the couch or a chair, whatever it is that can help you to get ready to engage in our conversation and make sure we have that connection that's not disturbed. I like to feel this is that amount of time that I take from you, which might only be 30 to 45 minutes to focus just on you. So I'm going to ask you to be a little selfish and to not be distracted. You can be distracted after. All right, everybody, with that being said, onward to episode five. So, of course, before I jump into episode five, I always give a small little recap of episode four, which remember you can find at mayakai.com and all the other podcast platforms I mentioned. Um, you didn't have to necessarily hear episode four for episode five to make sense, but they're kind of a tandem of one another. They're, I'm building up from episode four. So I'd strongly encourage you to go back and listen to it. And there's even like a little companion podcast I created for episode four. I entitled it Maya Reflection, episode four, because someone came back to me and said, you know, you shared some great information in episode four. Can you tell me how you used it? And so I used that kind of companion podcast, Maya Reflection, to provide that insight to help people understand how to use the tools that I discussed in episode four. So you can also check that out as well. It's a companion. I think it'll help you to really understand the attachment styles we talked about, which lends to your character and personality traits, kind of the origins of them, so to speak. And then we got into your languages of love. There's five. Which one is you? How do you need for people to kind of interact and respond to you kind of when you're your best version of yourself, it's when this happens, when people respond to you this way, because this is a need you have in regards to your language of love. So that's what episode four got into. So episode five is going to build it up a little bit more, but I want to go back and focus on something that I used in episode four to also drive this conversation. So episode four, I used a collection of articles from the Psychology Today website that pretty much asserted that how well do you know yourself? And it kind of said in its own way to challenge you in this way, that self-knowledge is practically impossible to attain because at the core of it, it feels 
that from a psychology standpoint, we're biased creatures. And there is some truth into that, I'll be honest. Um, we tend to see ourselves one way and maybe how we project ourselves or present ourselves to others does not always align with how we see ourselves. But more importantly, being able to look at yourself and be objective to see what's in the mirror, to see perhaps where is a disconnect between who you think you are and who others think you are is the bigger challenge in that. So what was asserted in the Psychology Today articles? I'm going to read this to you because I think it's important. Self-knowledge is practically impossible to attain. We're all biased creatures, especially when it comes to the face in the mirror. But you can achieve greater objectivity and insight by tuning into a few tested principles and relying on the feedback of others. I'm going to say that again. Relying on the feedback of others can help you to gain the insight that may be disconnected or missing. I'm going to let that rain down on you a little bit because it's like a thunderstorm of what do you mean relying on the, on the perceptions of others? For a lot of people, that makes them uncomfortable. That within itself creates a storm within people because you have someone right now who I know is saying, Maya, I don't care what people think about me. I'm doing me. And on the flip side, you have someone else who will say, I really struggle with, you know, making other people happy and what they think of me. It really matters. It matters probably to more than what I think about myself. And most of my actions drive me to do what I do based on others and not my own personal thoughts and desires. Now, be honest, most people don't really say it that way, but that's kind of where they're at. Well, I'm going to help you find a happy middle on this. For the people who think that they don't care about what other people think, and for the people who care about what everyone thinks, here's that happy medium for you. You don't have to care about what everyone thinks because that's nearly impossible and you will drive yourself ragged with it. But you do care about what certain people think in your life. And that also can run you ragged. So, specific people, certain people, let's be honest, are people that often are key figures and our relationship realms that are private, which are significant others, if you have children, parents, siblings, friends, professional realms, might be boss, co-workers, and even that perversive realm where those relationships are not as important as maybe professional or private, but they're still people you interact with and they have a certain impact in your life. Not maybe high level, because there's levels to impact in your life with people, but they still are people that you engage with that affects you in some way. So within those other relationship realms, outside of this personal realm, which we're jumping into, again from episode four, which was you, me, myself, and I, your entourage, it's important this foundation is solid and you understand where you're coming from with this. Because if you lack understanding of self, chances are you will meander through your life and never really be happy because you'll be working to other people's expectations because you're not quite sure what your own expectations are. So, with that being said, I'm going to quickly revisit again about objectivity and subjectivity. Objectivity is seeing something outside of yourself. So your opinions don't drive what you think, whereas subjectivity, your opinions, your feelings, your thoughts drive whatever response you have to something. Gaining objectivity is one of the toughest things to do because it means looking at yourself and being honest with what you see. And I'll be honest, a lot of people can't do that. I've had moments where even I've struggled with it, but I realized though that struggle might be real, being able to do it was the difference in me being able to move to a whole nother level of happiness. So what we're going to do in episode five, which we didn't do in episode four, is we focused on learning about attachment styles that affect you as a child that played into your character and personality as an adult and understanding those things of how you respond and communicate to people. And then what you need from people in your languages of love, whereas in episode five, we're going to shift to how well do you know yourself as well as in terms of rather what you think and who you think you are versus what other people see you as. 
there can be a disconnect. And when there's a disconnect with us, this is when we tend to have more friction because the idea of being cohesive in who you are inside and outside can be a tough thing to do, even for those of us that work hard at it. So let's get back to the idea of self-knowledge, that it can't be attained due to natural human bias. But objectivity and insight can be obtained. I'm going to actually leave that up to you to decide. If you think, now I'm pretty land, I'm pretty fixed on this. I don't know that I'm changing. Or if you can say, I do think there are some things about me now that I really have looked in the mirror and, and thought about past situations that have happened, that a little bit of improvement could be warranted. That's objectivity. That's the first start in the journey of objectivity. Think on that for a minute. Because I'm assuming if you're tuned in and you're listening, it means you're open to the idea that somehow you can improve yourself. And generally people who aren't either don't know about it or don't want to know about it. That's the difference. So let's get some perspective on how you can use outside feedback to gain greater insight into yourself. And it's a tool. It's a tool like anything else. So imagine you and your best friend or significant other, your mother, your father, or even your child are looking out a window. Now, generally, you would see a lot of the same things, a car driving by, people outside walking, maybe cutting grass. Um, It's a general landscape of what you're visually and auditorily taking in, okay? But you may notice things that the other person did not and vice versa. You may notice a magnolia tree that's in bloom in the neighbor's yard and a robin was sitting on a branch, Someone else might have taken note to a fuel stream that a plane that has long since passed by left behind, and you didn't even notice that. See, perspective is part of understanding ourselves and others. And, you know, we rarely see ourselves the way others see us. And the truth be told, it's because how can you actually really know what someone thinks about you if you don't ask or if their actions don't kind of show it to you. So where do you start with all this? Well, let's get back to the window. But we're gonna create a different kind of a window that you can use as an evaluation process. In fact, it's called Jahari's window. So here's where I get like a little textbooky on you and you know, clinical, but it's a great tool that I've used and I'm gonna tell you something. The insight was amazing that I gained from this because it wasn't just about me assessing myself. I used others to see where I aligned and where I disconnected with experience with people as a person. So, Jahari's window is a technique that helps people to better understand their relationships with themselves and others. So it's about gaining insight into personality awareness. That's a big one personality awareness. Remember we talked in episode four about attachment styles, which kind of generate some of your personality and character types as a child. And then experience in time kind of either shapes that, changes it, or kind of continues to push it forward. Well, now you can get a feel for how much of that is true. Because sometimes, you know what they tell you, if you keep hearing the same thing about yourself repeatedly, there's a chance some of it might be true. But the question is why? So, Jahari's window is about personality awareness. And it was created by two psychologists, Joseph Luft and Harrington Ingram in the 1950s. A lot of tools we use in psychology were created um, in, in the early part of the century, like the 1920s through the 1950s are a big staple of theories and tools that over time have been modified. But this one pretty much has stayed consistent. So Jahari's window, which is a combination of the two creators named Joseph and Harrington, they just just called it Jahari for whatever reason, doesn't matter. It's a window that refers to four quadrants, like a window pane, not like a solid window, but think about those old school window panes with four little windows broken up by wood that you sometimes still see in people's houses. Um, So what happens with Jahari's window is a tool to help you gain the insight into perception of self versus perceptions that others have of you. So As I said, well, why does this matter? Well, you might be one of those people, like I said, who struggle with thinking that you are a certain way, but why do you get a response from people sometimes? Because it doesn't seem warranted. And you might be a person that everything you do is driven by how you interact with people. So this is why this tool could be interesting to help you figure it out. 
And, and you do care what people think. Like I said before, it's just not everybody. And it shouldn't be everybody. So what Jahari Windows does is it gives you insight into things. It's four quadrants that look at specific things. The first quadrant is what we call the open quadrant. It's what you know about yourself and what other knows, know about you. So my example for me would be, I love cats. And people know I love cats. I'm a sports junkie. And people know I'm a sports junkie. There's no doubt about it. These are things that are known about me. The second quadrant, or pain, is kind of more of what we call a blind spot, so to speak. It's things that maybe you don't know about yourself, as well as it's not known to others. And you're kind of saying, well, if I don't know it and they don't know it, how does it exist? Well, if you sometimes experience something will happen and you'll be like, I didn't know that about myself. And key people in your life, these aren't just random relationships, will be like, I didn't realize about that about you either. I totally thought that you were like this kind of person. Another quadrant or pain in Jahari's window is a hidden one. It's something that's known to you, but not to others in your life. So for instance, it might be that you suffer from anxiety. And because you feel it's a detriment, you try to hide that from people. So generally speaking, people don't know that you suffer from anxiety, which means situations could arise and you may act a certain way to avoid the anxiety, which then might be interpreted different by someone else. Just an example. And that final quadrant is called the unknown. It's something you don't know about yourself, but it's known by others. And again, somebody's saying, how the hell does somebody know something about me that I don't know? <laughs> See, this is why it's interesting. Now, mind you, I always say that things that I share I don't always feel that they're hard and fast, and I don't feel that people's perceptions of you are always right. I always feel that situations can be indicative of behavior. Emotions drive behaviors. So let's be honest. There are some people that literally may bring out the worst in you, and there are other people that may bring out the best in you. One of the things that's interesting about me, and other people might be able to connect with this as well, is that I have like four different circle of friends. <laughs> and no, I don't feel like I have multiple personalities either in having these different circle of friends. These friends have kind of had their own autonomous existence because the first group were people that I knew early on in college. And then as I matured and maybe entered into workplaces or started doing other type of social activities, I met other people and hence other friend groups were created. I never intentionally kept these people separate, but I will tell you that I noticed distinctive differences in how my friend groups interact with me and what they think of me, which at times have made me say, well, what is it about these people that make me different than with these people? That's the question I started to ask myself. And why Jahari's window helped me, because there's going to be a tool on myekai.com. There's a tab that says podcast resources. Click on it, go to episode five. And there's going to be a Jahari Windows test you can take online. The website says you click, it takes you to it. It's really simple to use. Now this is if you're feeling brave because I did it. And luckily most of the traits I felt I have, like in being intelligent, outgoing, things like that, it gives a list of traits. And it asks you to pick a list of traits that you feel are who you are, embody you as a person. And then it asks you to pick several people, I think three to four people, to email the test to, to pick words they think describe you. And then it sends you back the results. And generally speaking, most of what I thought about myself did align with other people. There were a few things that I was kind of surprised about, but not totally. And I felt like if I had sent it to three different people in a different friend group, I might have seen some of the descriptors used that weren't used with the three people I sent it to were people that I had known for the longest. And to be honest, I kind of felt more comfortable asking them to do it than the people who were still good friends. But I felt like, well, you've known me for more than 25 years. I feel like you should have some decent insight. But more importantly, I wanted to see what they thought of me. What's interesting is I'd actually like to give those same people the test now because I have a feeling they may pick some different words to describe me because some situations and experience that have happened that have totally changed the nature of our relationship. But here's what's weird. It doesn't mean that I have changed as a person. 
It means situations or circumstances maybe brought something out. And this is where those quadrants are so interesting. So make sure you go to mayakai.com, click on the podcast resource section, and boom, take the test. Pick three people you feel like will be honest and don't surprise them. Say, hey, I'm doing this personality test kind of thing to get a feel for like how I see myself versus other people. See me? I'm doing some self-reflection. And please be very honest. Here's, it, is, it does have um, autonomy to it, so you won't know who said what. So you can tell them that. You won't know that you said that. So it's just kind of general. But then you'll be, pon- you'll be pondering like, who thinks that I'm demanding? Who thinks that I'm antisocial? <laughs> but it's very insightful because the whole point of the test is to help you to gain greater insight into why is there a disconnect between how you feel you are versus why they think you are that way. Now, mind you, one of the things that I said in this is that time is one of the biggest factors in change. Who you might be at 10 20, 30, and 40 clearly is not going to be the same person. Though I do say at the core of who you are, there are some things that are pretty hard and fast. Um, A word that I used to hate to describe me, but I think it's spot on and I've kind of embraced it, is I used to feel very rigid socially. But I found that that rigidity (laughs) wasn't with everybody. And I stepped back and I said, Well, why is it that with certain people I'm so rigid, but then I get over here with this group of people and I'm not so rigid? And then I started exploring more about the friend groups to say, what is it within this friend group that gives me a level of comfort? Is there a difference of expectation? Are those people more self-reflected and adjusted? Like, what is it different about each of these friend groups? that I perform or behave differently. And I totally came to realize it was about situation. It was about an experience and interaction. And the key thing was comfortability with self. So I found in certain friend groups that I felt I could be me without being judged. Judgment is one of the greatest things that drive us to restrict ourselves from fully living to our fullest potential. As I said in episode Thor's companion episode, Maya Reflection, somebody said this, and I love stealing other people's sayings, and I'll give credit to it. Good is the enemy of great. And you're like, what? How can that be? Because. Matter of fact, let me just let that sit for a second. Good is the enemy of great. Think about that for a minute. Bring it back. Here's what that means. If you are good at something, there is a high probability you are comfortable with it. And comfort can lead to complacency, which means you never strive to be better or the best version of yourself because you're not uncomfortable where you are. And good within our society has become the norm and the standard. In fact, good is starting to look a lot like mediocrity if you want to know the truth from my opinion. That's just my opinion. I have an issue with the idea that everybody gets a trophy. Because if you don't fail, then you never really know how to be better at something and you should never be comfortable with the ideal of failure. It's the thing that strives you to want to do better. So as we take a society of people and say, well, everyone's a winner. Well, guess what? Everybody isn't a winner, winner, chicken dinner. They're just not. But it doesn't mean that you can't be. Because then you start exploring, what am I good at? What am I not good at? What's my SWAT? Strength, weaknesses, opportunity. Ooh, what's those threats to kind of like compromise me as a person? And you start working to the things that you're better at. You find your niche in life. You stop trying to get in where you fit in and you fit in where you want to get in. You find those circles. And that brings me back to my conversation about why I met certain people where all of a sudden my rigidness and my personality totally fell off because I wasn't trying to fit in. The other thing I came to realize about the relationships I had with people, whether it was 
with friendships or even relationships, when I felt while I was withholding myself or rigid, it's because legitimately, here's the key thing, people, I felt those people would never accept who I was as a person. And it wasn't that I didn't feel good enough. I just watched their personality types, how we interacted in our friend groups, and I decided to withheld me because I just felt I didn't fit. And real talk, I had felt that way for years. And these were people that I respected, loved, and cared for. And here's what's interesting, made myself very vulnerable to. So when they hurt me, it was really deep. I was like, wow, I allowed myself to be hurt this way in real talk. I never really felt like I felt I fit in. And they made me really feel more like that right now. It's interesting. So with that being said, Jahari's window kind of allows you to get a, some insight into how you see yourself and really think about the words you pick. I can't remember. It might be five. It might be ten words. It limits it because it gives you a whole lot of words. And you're like, oh, you got to really pick the words you feel describe you. And then you send it to those people and they pick it. This might be something great to do with your significant other, your children. And the thing is, prepare for it in the sense of they're not being critical. You're asking them to be honest because you're trying to be self-reflective. You're trying to, you know, gain self-knowledge so that you can keep elevating emotionally, mentally, keeping you healthy physically. Because, you know, when you're stressed out and depressed, it affects you physically. And often when you, when you gain insight into yourself, you gain insight in other areas, even financially. I am ambitious, but I'm not ambitious in the right way. I'm not ambitious for the right reasons. Maya, what does that mean? Hold up. I'm about to put a loaded weapon on. <laughs> Maya, what does that mean? Here's what that means. If your ambition is driven by somebody else's expectations and desires, chances are you will never be fulfilled. We're taking a step back. And Maya, my ambition, your ambition, to find out, what is it that drives you for you, not for others? And I'm going to say this too. It's not about your significant others. It's not about your parents. It's not about your kids. It's about you. Because when you find satisfaction at that me, myself, and I level, how you excel in your other relationships are amazing. Because you're confident, you're competent. And when you feel those two things, that synergy, it flows in other places and people feel it. People feel it. The minute I ended relationships that, to a degree, I'll be honest, were toxic, but they were around for a while because we had been around for a while. <laughs> Time is not always indicative that it's healthy for you because something has been around. So with that being said, when I ended some friendships that made me vulnerable and hurt me on a level that I had never been hurt, can I just tell you that the burden that lift off my chest was amazing. And the thing about it was, I wish those people no ill will. In fact, I hope they can have continued success in their lives. My thing is, I want you to feast. I want you to have everything in life it is that you seek. I just don't desire to have you at my table. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? But that's for real. There's people in your life right now that you may be bringing more to the table than they are. And they are feasting off your hard work and your dedication and your loyalty. And your plate is half full, damn near empty. And their plate is full. Because some people have no problem with being selfish. And we'll tell you that. I had a friend who said this. I'm sorry, you know, I did that to you. And that was so selfish of me. It was. But here was the problem, the flawed issue with that. It wasn't the first time that friend had been selfish with me. And I forgave the first time. But I also felt, by admitting that she was selfish, she kind of felt that would make the apology more acceptable. Be able to see through people's absolute BS people. Because often people know exactly what they're doing. They understand the damage or collateral damage that can happen from their actions. But they're willing to take the fallout because chances are you've always been a forgiving person. Guess what? That's something that could be in your blind spot. Maybe you don't know it, maybe they don't know it. It's also something that might be unknown to you. They know that you're forgiving under all circumstances and you don't see yourself that way. You don't see that as a crutch that can really cause issues in your relationship, but they know damn well you're gonna forgive. And you just think it's because you're a kind and understanding person. You never saw that as being a possible disability emotionally to yourself. 
See, this is where Jahari window helps you to understand. So when you start seeing things like understanding and compassionate, step back and say, hmm, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm not trying to make you go overboard and overthink this. I just really want you to know if their words are different than your words, okay, it doesn't mean that you're not congruent. It means there's something they're seeing for some reason differently than you are. And is it more about the situation that you interact with those people? Or is it legitimately, this is just how you project to just them? Even though at the core of who you are, you're like, well, I don't, I don't agree with that. Here's the thing. It's not for you to agree or disagree with the results you get back from the Jahari Windows test. It's for you to have self-reflection and self-knowledge to say, why is this not congruent? And understand their perceptions of you are not more important than your perceptions of yourself. Because the whole point of this particular episode is to let you know who is it that you want to be. And if somehow you got feedback different than the person you want to project, then figure out how to become more congruent in your relationships. So if you want to be understanding yet not taken for granted, figure out how to make that happen. Which usually means better communication and honesty. If you want to be honest consistently, but you feel like you can't be because you have to spare someone's feelings, then you know what? Again, this all comes back to learn how to communicate so that you can be congruent in those relationships with people. We often, as I often say, and I, I don't know if someone coined this before me, but I've been saying it for years. The reason that people lie is because the truth hurts. The truth hurts part isn't new. I just might have added on the reason people lie is because the truth hurts. If the truth could be easily accepted and often didn't come with fallout and, and you know, circumstances that are less desirable, we would all tell the truth and the world would be a better place. But often we lie because one, we either want to get out of trouble, we don't want to hurt someone's feelings, we don't want to be seen as being a bad person. So there's different reasons why people lie. And if that's something you struggle with, you know, a little white lie is still a lie. The first question to ask yourself, if you cannot be honest with someone, is why can't I be honest? I have a person, a friend, who cannot be honest with people solely because she is afraid they will stop being her friend and abandon her. But here's one important. The underlying narrative behind that is she's afraid to be alone. And that became more apparent to me in quarantine than any other time before. And because I happen to be a counselor, you know, there, we have an ethics thing where we, we're never supposed to counsel our friends or family members, close relationships, because it's a conflict of interest, because you're too invested. And to be honest, most of your friends and relatives will not often take what you say worth a grain of salt because they know you. Now, some people I can honestly say come back to me all the time and ask me my opinion on things because I think they truly respect me as a person as well as the fact that I'm a counselor. And I always start my conversation are you asking me this as your friend or are you asking me this as a counselor? Because I want to know which answer I should give you. And they look at me like, what? I said, because. I said, I want to be absolutely honest with you. As your friend, I'm like sugarcoated. As your, as your therapist or counselor, I'm going to shoot straight from the hip and just tell you what I think. You know what's interesting? I said, there's some things I noticed about you in quarantine. She had high anxiety and some other things going on. And I said, I'd really like to talk to you about it, but I'm not sure if you'll like what I have to say. And you know what she said to me? I don't want to talk about that right now. She goes, because I know probably what you're about to say to me is going to be true. And I don't want to, I don't want to know. And I'm going to tell you something. The reason her life is the way that it is. And she's an older woman, like 56. She's older than me, not old. is because she will not step behind that veil of self-doubt and self-sabotage because she is so driven what other people think of her. And here's what's more important. She doesn't really know what she thinks about herself. Imagine going through life and not actually knowing what you think about yourself. That's danger. Because how can you rather ever, ever get to a level of happiness if your happiness is always vicariously through someone else? And there are people who live that way. They live their lives vicariously through others because they feel that's the best way to attain happiness. Well, I can tell you that it doesn't work for me. Because usually what often makes other people happy tends to cut me short. I, I will tell you this, though. I clearly believe it's something within my personality type, which within my attachment styles I talked about. I will encourage you to go back and listen to episode four and actually listen to the companion podcast, Maya Reflection, episode four, that I talked about my shortcoming in one of my attachment styles. 
I have learned to not be afraid to tell people how I feel about things, but I also say the art of communication is phenomenal for me because every conversation I start out with somebody, I preface it with, I need to talk to you about something. This is a good time because this is something about me. Um, and if this isn't a good time for you, then we can do it some other time. And most people are like, <laughs> curiosity killed the cat. No, what is it? Okay, with that being said, I need to share something with you that's bothering me. One, it doesn't mean that you see it this way. It doesn't mean it's 100% right. But for right now, I feel like it's my truth because it's how I feel. And I feel like if I don't discuss this with you, it's going to keep happening and it's going to keep bothering me. And I feel like this is something that affects our relationship, not in a positive way. And I'm all about ascending up in my relationships. So I need to tell you this. Please don't take it, even though you may feel offended, because I don't know that your intention was for me to ever feel this way, but it's how I feel. I find when you set the table with your conversation and you leave it open, somebody who emotionally, who's emotionally intelligent, which means they're empathetic, not sympathetic. You're not looking for sympathy. You're looking for someone who can connect with what you're saying. And by the way, emotional intelligence, a lot of people aren't there. Being able to understand themselves as well as other is something that comes with hard work and time and experience. And a lot of people don't even know it's something they should be doing. But a person who is an emotional intelligent person will hear what you have to say and not shoot you down for it and say, well, that was never my intention. I'm sorry you felt that way, but I'm glad you told me because now I know. Hmm. Imagine how much better your relationships could be if someone extended you that courtesy and you extended that same courtesy to someone else. It's amazing what you could achieve. Yet there's often fear with being honest with people because a lot of people feel they'll be shut down or shut out by those that they care about or love or respect or need in their lives. If you have that strong of a dependency on someone to be a part of your life, yet they're not fully accepting who you are as a person... That's a detriment. And you have to then go back and look at why that relationship has that kind of meaning. And I guarantee you, at the root of it, it will always come back to you. So let's get back to Jahari's window. Remember, go to mayakai.com, click on the podcast resource section, go to episode five, and there's a link, a link there that will take you to the test. Take it. I challenge you on this. If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. You know this. Stole that from somebody too. But I want you to do it because at the core of all your healthy relationships is going to be you understanding you because the best you creates better, not good relationships, but great relationships because that's what we're shooting for. Not just good. We want great relationships, but you got to start with that great relationship with yourself. So back to Jahari's window. That first pain, it's open. It's what's known to you. It's what's known to others. It's that blind spot in the second pain. It's what's not known to self, but it's known to others. And this is where the exploration part gets interesting. Because it's like, what does somebody know about me? I don't know about myself, like I said earlier. The hidden realm, that pain, it's something that's known to you and not known to others. Do you see how these two right here is where the disconnect happens in that, in that blind and those hidden pains? The danger that lurks and you not understanding you may be projecting something to others that you don't know that you are, and that at the same time you might be projecting things to others that they don't know, this is where a lot of miscommunication and relationships go awry. And that fourth, the unknown. If it's not known to you, it's not known to them, all of a sudden it becomes known and you might discover it together. Or that unknown pain may actually matriculate. Think about it this way. Something happens, an experience, in a key relationship you have with someone, and all of a sudden, it may jump into a hidden realm, meaning you just found out something about yourself you didn't know, but it's not known to somebody else. Or something from the unknown, from a situation that happens, may jump into a blind realm, where all of a sudden people discover something about you that you didn't know about you. I'll give you a good example of a hidden part for me, because I think it's important for me to share, because I'm going to wind down the podcast soon. Something that was hidden for me, and I talked about this in the Maya Reflection episode four, is I'm a person that struggles, though I have a secure attachment style, the one area I'm not congruent with that is though I'm okay with people depending on me and needing me, I'm always going to be there. I struggle with letting other people be there for me. It's something that 
within my upbringing, it was that need for independence and autonomy about being self-sufficient and not actually relying on others is why I'm that way. I'm even that way with like family members. Like I'm the kind of person I could be starving and damn near homeless before I would ask for help. That's how I used to be. I've learned to move past that, that you're not weak because you ask for help. But for me, what was hidden, there was a stretch for me where at a bout of depression that was actually tied, I'm an older woman, <laughs> when I was going through menopause. And depression was really something that I struggled with. Um, and to the point, I didn't realize it until I actually was talking to a healthcare provider and we were talking about some health stuff and we explored it. And I said, you know what's funny? I was just thinking it was just the daily grind that was kind of wearing me out. Besides feeling fatigued, the emotional piece, I was discounting to other things and I brought it center. And the minute I understood that, a lot of things changed for me, but it did affect my relationship with others because of how I responded. So just to say, I kept that hidden from others. Along that time I was experiencing depression, I also had two parents that were going through illnesses that I was struggling with and I'm an only child. I didn't really share that with people. How at the core of me, it was really, I was struggling with it. I kept it to myself, but yet it was being shown to others in different ways. It was hidden to me but it was affecting my relationships differently and they didn't know why. You know what's funny is? They didn't ask that. But with that being said, take the Jahari Windows test. Go to mayakai.com. And don't be afraid to challenge yourself. Pick those words at the core. You really feel this is who you are. And pick three really reliable people. I think it's three. It could be more. You send them an email and tell them what you're doing and say, I want you to be absolutely honest and complicit in your responses. I won't know what you said. It won't tell me that it's you. But I want to see this piece so that I can understand how I can grow and be better at things. I would challenge you to give it to a significant other, maybe a parent, and even your child. And you might start to understand why there might be some rifts in relationships based on how people perceive you, based on how you believe that you are. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for listening to this episode. As I said, the whole purpose of this podcast is to help you identify your ambitions, but more importantly, to harness that motivation to help you acquire the satisfaction you seek in your life. Remember, episodes are always available in the iTunes, Google Play, and the iHeartRadio podcast platforms, as well as you can always go to mayakai.com. Voila, it's there. Don't forget to check out the podcast resource section because anything I'm using per episode is where you find things. That's where you're going to find the Jahari Windows test. So make sure you go there. And until next time, remember, your present becomes your past and your future is no more. So make sure to make the most of every single day. Ciao. Ambition, your ambition podcast. Something that I take pride in is trying to be forward thinking, thinking outside the box, challenging myself. And as I challenge myself, hopefully I challenge you. Find Maya on Twitter and Instagram at Maya underscore Akai. On Facebook at Maya Akai Presents. We're going to talk health, wealth, fitness, mental health, financial, lots of different things that can empower you as you seek out the ambition that you're pursuing. That you're pursuing. Or get everything Maya at MayaAkai.com.